And as we study the book of Daniel, you'll see in several places where the things that Daniel was going, the things that were going on in those days and the things that he says are going to happen in the future days, today they're not going on. An obvious interruption has taken place. But nonetheless, all the Word of God is for us uh, to study, and uh, maybe not all written to us in, in doctrine, but all for us. And so we come to the book of Daniel and realize that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So Daniel chapter 1, we're over into verse 8, and I remind you just the beginning part of verse 8 when it says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. We, we studied this and we realized that the things that have led up to this point, when you read verses 5 and 6 and 7, that you re realize that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the nation of Israel, Daniel, in his first in the first point of captivity. We realize there's Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and conquered it three different times before he totally wiped it out, as God said he would finally do. And in the first uh, time he conquered it, he took some people away. We can either call it three sieges that Nebuchadnezzar had upon uh, the city of Jerusalem or three deportations because each time he, he conquered the city, he took away more and more people and more and more of the gold that was in the city until finally he just leveled the city. Uh, so Daniel was taken in the first deportation. And uh, when in, in Daniel's time when he was taken, Nebuchadnezzar had a thing where when they would conquer a city, they would seek out the best in that city. Probably, as you realize, that Daniel was going to be trained in what we call the University of Babylon, in U of B. Uh, he was going to be trained there for three years. It said in verse 5 that he might stand before the king. That is, he's going to be brought into the cabinet of the king to become an advisor to the king. And it's been suggested that, that kings would do that in those days, that rather than put in their cabinet people of their own nation, those people could overthrow them and take dictatorship away from Nebuchadnezzar, that he would take, as he conquered cities, he would take the best of the people of those, of those nations, train them and totally associate them, uh, uh, isolate them from their nation, give them a new identity and train them to serve him because they couldn't overthrow him in government. No one's going to follow a foreigner. But he can use their talent and their minds and their abilities as, as advisors in his cabinet. And so he's training Daniel and his friends for such a, a position of that. And so Daniel, who was taken away from the captivity, and, and we know that famine and sword and death is going to follow in his homeland, here he is, living in a king's palace, attending school, having the king's portion of the king's table brought to him, the meat and the, uh, the wine which he drank brought before him to eat. But all of this was also a means of trying to change Daniel's identity. And while Nebuchadnezzar could strip Daniel of everything that externally he associated with, his people brought away and lived in Babylon, living in, in, in his palace and stripping him of, of all of his past and all of his learning by giving him a new education and stripping him of, of the garments that he wore, changing his clothing so that he would have the clothing that would match uh, royalty in Babylon, and then also changing his name, as we see in verse 7, that while Nebuchadnezzar can strip Daniel of all the external things, one thing Nebuchadnezzar can never change, and that is Daniel's heart. You can change all the external things, but verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the prince of the eunuch that he might not defile himself. Now, in, in this passage of Scripture, let's go back up into verse 7 and realize the names and why they changed their names. Verse 7 says, Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave the name unto Daniel, the name of Belteshazzar, and unto Hananiah uh, of Shadrach, and unto Mishael of Meshach, and unto Azariah of Abednego. Now what he's doing is they're changing the names to give them Babylonian names because Israel would naturally raise their children and give them names to identify them with, with the God of Israel and the service that they were called as a nation to serve the true and living God. For instance, the name Daniel means God is my judge, referring to Jehovah God. God is my judge. Well, they couldn't have a man serve in the courts of Babylon with a name like that. And so they tried to change his identity, even his association with God, and call him by another name, Belteshazzar, which means the Prince of Bel. 
and I believe it's Jeremiah references chapter 41 and, and right in there it's chapter 51 and chapter 50 that talks about the God of Bel the the pagan God of Babylon the chief pagan God of Babylon is Bel and so they call him the Prince of Bel they took Hananiah and they changed his name to Shadrach which means commanded by Rack Mishael, they changed his name. Oh, by the way, Hananiah's name meant beloved of the Lord. And they changed that to mean commanded by Rack. Mishael's name means who is like God. And they changed his name to be Meshach, who is like Shaq. And then they have uh, Azariah, God is my help. And they changed it to Abednego, which means uh, the servant of Nego. Now, each one of those, Rack... For instance, they changed Hananiah to be to be Shadrach, mean commanded by Rack. Rack is the sun god. Uh, Mishael, uh, Mishael was changed to Meshach, who is like Shaq. Shaq is the queen of heaven. Uh, Azariah, God is my help, was changed to Abednego, and Abednego means uh, Nego, the fire god. And so what they've done is they've taken away the association of Daniel and his friends from being identified with the true and living God to be identified with the Babylonian gods. We saw that from the very second verse where even the gold is taken from the temple in, in Jerusalem and brought into the temple of their God with a small g. That is, we're talking about idolatry. Gods that are, what the Bible says, no gods. And now their names have been changed. And I have been uh, rebuked uh, through message, not personally, but rebuked by someone once making a statement what is Daniel's three friends' name? And I know they're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But you know, when I was asked, what is God's name for them, the God-given name, I have to stop and really think and hardly can come up with it, being Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Uh, for some reason, we're just so used to using those pagan terms, I don't know, it just must be our old nature within us or something, that as we think of Daniel and his friends, we might catch Daniel's name. We don't hardly ever call him Belteshazzar. But we always call his three friends by their pagan names, which isn't right. Uh, they're, they're not called that. Later on in the books, they're going to be called by their pagan names because they're associated with, uh, with Nebuchadnezzar's uh, commands and rules and what he's calling them. But as we go through chapter 1, it's very clear that, that it continues to use their other name, their true name, that identifies them with the true God. And uh, it's, it's because it, it introduces them to us and just tells us that their names have been changed. Anyhow, that what we've seen there in Daniel, while he could change everything externally in Daniel, he could not change Daniel's internal heart. He could not change the fact that Daniel knew who the true God was. Call me what you want, he says, but I am uh, related to Jehovah God and, and he is my judge. And so... They couldn't touch the things that were attached to Daniel's heart. What's attached to your heart? Can I show you a passage of Scripture before we even get into our study? Come over with me to the book of Luke. Hold your place in Daniel. Luke chapter 9. A passage of Scripture I really, I guess we understand it. I, I always did, but never could quite see it or sense the, the depth of the meaning until I realized, put myself in Daniel's shoes, and realized it from his point of view. Daniel, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 9, verse 24. I asked you, what's attached to your heart? Because Daniel lives in a time of great tribulation upon the nation of Israel in his day. Not the tribulation to come, but definitely like the tribulation to come. And, and, the, and what we're reading about in Luke 9 is the same type of... Uh, things that are going to go on in the future that went on in Daniel's day. Daniel was stripped of everything. And we read in Luke chapter 9, verse 25, when God begins to prepare the nation of Israel for their future time and the tribulation and the things that they're the hardship they're going to face then, it says, For what is what what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall uh, be ashamed of me and my words of him shall the son of man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and in, in and of the holy angels back up to verse 24 it says for whosoever will save his life shall lose it Do you remember last week we talked about Daniel that if he would have tried to keep his his life 
the way he had it for captivity came, that God was saying that nothing is going to change my mind. I've given Jerusalem over to the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, and he's going to wipe it clean as a, as a, as a man, wipe up the plate and turn it around and wipe the back that he's going to totally demolish the land. God says, I've given it over and nothing's going to change my mind. Do you realize if Daniel would have tried to save his life, that is, everything that surrounded his life that, that externally meant something to him, that if he would have tried to hang on to all those things, hid from Nebuchadnezzar, stayed in that land, he would have been part of the death, the famine, and the sword that came through that land. He would have lost his life, wouldn't he? Now look at that look at that passage in Luke chapter 9 verse 24 whosoever shall save his life that's not talking about your that's ta- that's talking about the things that are attached to you externally that surround your life whosoever shall save his life shall lose it in the tribulation days if all things mean so much to you and you cling on to them you'll definitely lose your soul that's what verse uh, 25 was talking about uh, again, verse 25, for what if a man, what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself? As it says in Mark, lose his own soul. You realize yourself is your soul. Verse 24, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Isn't that what Daniel did? Daniel realized, boy, I better follow the will of the Lord and let Nebuchadnezzar take me captive because he promised me in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 11, that he would cause the enemy to treat him well. And so he lost his life. Everything that externally meant anything to him there, he, God said, I'm going to give it over to Nebuchadnezzar. So he gave it up and was taken captive and he found his life. His life centers in God. But down in his heart where God was dealt, dealing and working, that that is what true life is. Not the external, but the internal. A lesson that's going to have to be learned in the end times when Israel goes through their final times of trial and tribulation. But Daniel learned it back here. And I finally now understand what Luke means more than I did before. Perhaps you do too. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with, a mine, uh, with, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, what we're going to learn today in in the following verses, and perhaps maybe even take it all the way to verse 21, that Daniel, as he's taken captive, he has to, he's under new environment. There's a whole new situation here. And we learn in Daniel's life the difference between compromise, compliance, and standing for the faith, or what we might call commitment or unswavering loyalty. See, Daniel's in a real strange predicament here. I mean, he's stripped of everything. He's being given all this, these things that identify with Babylon. And we understand what Babylon identifies with, don't we? That Babylon is the seed of idolatry. And here, here Daniel is put in the center of it. Why? Because Israel wouldn't keep out of it. God said, stay out of idolatry. Stay away from the, the gods that the Gentiles are worshiping. Don't be, be separate from them. Don't have anything to do with them. But Israel always wanted to be just like them. So God says, have it your way. He lets them them get taken captive by Babylon, the thing that they were to separate from. So here's Daniel right in the palace, the headquarters of Babylon with all its Babylonian worship. And somehow he's going to have to take a stand somewhere. And and yet he's not going to exist without some kind of compromise or some kind of compliance. And so what we're going to learn here is where it is that we can compromise things that we can comply with and things that we just draw a line and say, no, what any cost, I won't do. In fact, you don't just learn it in chapter 1 of Daniel. You'll see it as we go through the book of Daniel where those lines are. But right away we begin to see Daniel purposes in his heart that he's not going to defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. He realizes there's something wrong with the, what the king of Babylon eats and therefore, in what he drinks, and although he is given a portion of the king's meat and the wine which he drank, Daniel says, I'm not eating that stuff. Now, he's about to take a stand. We see him taking a stand in verse 8. He's purposing in his heart. He's going to take a stand. But I want you to see how he takes a stand so that we can learn something about how we ought to do it. See, what he does, and notice it says there at the end of verse 8, therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuch that he might not defile himself. You know, you and I, when we start thinking about taking a stand, sometimes we get a little jitterish when it t- comes time to take that stand and we get a little tongue-tied and the words don't seem to come out right. And, and we, How are we going to express to someone, I'm going to take a stand here? 
And usually we just all hyper and, and just blurt it out and, and really kind of blow it in the sense that we, we attack the person. Daniel, he realized, i got to take a stand. No question about that. He knew where to take his stand. But when he deals with the other man, he requests of the prince of the eunuch that he would not defile himself. He doesn't come off saying, uh, demanding, I'm not going to do that. I refuse to eat that meat. That's probably how we do it. At least I would. But Daniel, he, he thought some things through. And he realized, yeah, I, I can take a stand, but I don't have to look like a rebellious person in doing that. I can request, find out just asking, maybe I won't have to eat it. So he, he calmly begins to, to deal with this man in a request of the prince of the eunuch. Just a request, not a demand, not a refusal. And he's reasonable with the man. Watch the man's answer, verse 10. And the prince of the eunuch said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your face worse, uh, uh, worse likewise than the children which are of your sort? Then shall he, then shall ye make me danger, in, uh, in danger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to, to Melzar, whom the prince of the, whom the prince of the eunuch had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and, uh, uh, Azariah. And so, Daniel's about to offer something. My point in verse 10 is Daniel's reasonable with the man. He makes a request rather than a demand, and the man says, now wait a minute, the king appointed you to eat this. And if you're asking me not to tell you to eat that, and at the end of the, the, uh, the time when you stand before the king, you don't look so good, and he finds out it's because I didn't give you the meat he ordered to give you, uh, my head's at stake here. And Daniel's reasonable with this man. He doesn't say, I don't care about you, i got to stand for the Lord. That's not how he reacts. He, he takes the man and realizes that man is just part of the system. He's caught in the system. He don't have the authority to rebuke the system. So Daniel's reasonable with the man. He's taking a stand and, and he's willing to deal with the man and, and make some concessions to, to, to some things. Notice Daniel also had a plan. He thought enough ahead to offer the man a way out where his, he could work and the man could work. And so it says in verse 12, here's what Daniel said to him. He said, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them, let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let, let our continence be looked upon before thee, and the continence of the children that eateth the portion of the king's meat, as thou, see, uh, settest, uh, as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to him uh, in this matter, and proved them ten days. So Daniel says, I'll tell you what, here's a way that we can work things out. Give me 10 days. Now, I got it. you're going to have me for three years. Give me 10 days. Feed us pulse. Then at the end of 10 days, you check. Don't put this before the king. By your eyes, you examine us. And then you do according to what you think you have to do at that point. So he offers the man a solution. He's willing to eat something different than, than what the, the man offered. And, and notice he gives some time. Do you see that? Daniel offers. He, he says, Let, let's give it 10 days here. See, when I look at that, I begin to realize some things. That, I, that took me a while to learn. And that is, everything's not done overnight. Daniel here, he's, he's taking a stand. He's not compromising at all. But he is willing, willing to make some compromise, some concession. He'll comply to a test. He, he, he gives the guy every way out, and he's willing to give some things some time, and he asks the man, you give it some time, 10 days, where that's not going to hurt anything. And so he's willing to give it a 10-day trial. Daniel's willing that at the end of 10 days, then he'll have to figure out that if he, his continence doesn't look good and the guy demands him to eat the meat, then he'll deal with that when the time comes. But he's now got 10 days to deal with. And he and his friends will go to prayer and, and, and seek the Lord's will and, and the Lord's way and, and, and strength from the Lord. And, and, but he give it some time. You know, I think of that because you and I, we live in, in times where we are an impatient people. Everything's just got to be done overnight for us. Actually, we live in extremes. Everything is either the worst or the best. I mean, nothing's ever mediocre, or is it? It's always the biggest and the largest and the most. It's got to be the strongest, the richest, the fastest. Don't we always live in extremes? Uh, you know, it's everybody or nobody. We, we, never just, we never really see things as they really are. And, you know, when I look at this and I see that Daniel, you know, he, he looks down the road, he's got three years before I stand before that king i got time to have a trial here and, and to see, let this man see that, 
that if we eat the things that God told us, that things will work out. Now, so Daniel's not in a rush. And that tells me that in the situations that we go through, whether it's tribulation, time of trials and testing as Daniel's going through, nothing has to be resolved just like that. Let time have its way. You know, when, when you talk about that, for instance, our conversations, I just jotted a few thoughts down. When you talk to someone, they always say, I have the worst cold I ever had. Don't they? I mean, boy, things got to be getting pretty bad because if it's the worst this time and the next time it's the worst again, pretty soon you're going to die of that cold. <laughs> but it, it's always the worst. We live in the biggest house on the block or they live in the biggest house on the block. Uh, it's always, we got the most luxurious car. You, know, you hear people bragging about their car, it's the most. Uh, you, you get into all the different he-man stuff and you got the strongest man or you can watch the richest man in the world type of thing, the most powerful uh, it's always, we got the largest whatever we could get. Isn't that why people always say that? Uh, kids always tell me, everybody is doing it. <laughs> that, everybody's doing it. Uh, everybody's wearing it. Uh, I have nothing to eat. I have nothing to wear. You know, when I was a kid, uh, when I was a kid and we used to you know, want to turn on the TV, I remember asking my mom, I said, what, what's on TV? She said, nothing's on. And to me, that used to really make me mad. You mean if I turn that TV on, it's going to be blank? <laughs> what do you mean nothing's on? <laughs> she just meant nothing on that you, you should see or watch. And, and uh, I just thought always bother me. What do you mean nothing's on? Well, uh, people do that all the time. I have nothing to wear. You go in a closet, there's clo <laughs> What's all that? <laughs> I mean, nothing you choose to wear today. But see, we're extreme. We're not talking in reality. And because of that, we cause frustration that, that we should never even have because we're thinking in those extremes. It would help if we just settled down a little bit and, and realized you don't have to have and you don't have to do and you can wait. In fact, that's the, big, that's the best advice you could ever have. Uh, how about the phrase, everything happens to me? Do you realize how depressed you can make yourself thinking that way? Oh, I broke a hangnail. I got a broken nail. Everything happens to me. I mean, you make a, ha uh, a, bro a broken nail as if the world caved in on top of you. But why? Because of what you're saying. Things really aren't as bad as the extremes we're always pushing it to be. I guess sometimes I think we want it to be the extremes so that we can have an excuse for failing. But the truth is, it's not extreme. Daniel was stripped of everything, wasn't he? No, he wasn't. God was with him. He knew that. He's going through a difficult time. They're wanting him to compromise. He's going to take a stand. But he's got some time to deal with the situation, doesn't he? So, boy, when, you know, the Bible puts things in a perspective. Hold your place here. Come on, Isaiah chapter 40. A verse of Scripture as well that does speak in, in, in context of the tribulation time, but an application that we can make. That's back to the left, just a few books. Isaiah chapter 40. And here's a verse of Scripture you can make some application from. Look at verse 28. <laughs> I like the question. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. To them that have no might, he increaseth strength. They don't even have any might, but he can increase strength. Uh, it says, uh, even the youth shall faint and, and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as do eagles. They shall run and not be weary. weary. They shall walk and not faint. And Israel is going to face a very difficult time. And when they do, what's the solution for the, for the time period they're living in? Anxiety. They've got to react immediately to situations. They're going to have to calm themselves down and wait on the Lord and seek His strength. Because if they run out in their own strength, they're going to fail. They're going to need Him to help and guide and direct them through. And to do that, you need to be patient. Daniel wants to give it some time. And he, and he asks for that time. And uh, therefore, the prince of the eunuch agrees to that. And Daniel has some time. I also notice as we consider Daniel in this compromise or in this this working situation out, that Daniel's willing to take less. 
I mean, he's offering the meat that belongs to the king and the wine drank. And Daniel says, no, I'm not supposed to eat that stuff, but I'll take less. I'll tell you what, I'll take some pulse. Sounds repulsive, doesn't it? <laughs> What's pulse? Well, I looked it up. It's, 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 it's bean soup, lentils. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, chick corn. It's uh, you know, just a vegetable diet is what it is. You just feed me some vegetable soup, some bean soup, and that'll be just enough for me. That'll be, that'll be enough. And uh, so that's what Daniel, he's willing to settle for less. He didn't have to have something better or something equal to the king's meat. He'll take something less uh, if it honors the Lord. And then when Daniel stood, he stood on faith. Daniel realized, and I think, if I think about this time in Daniel, see, the thing that the, kings, the king ate, that Israel was given a diet in Leviticus chapter 18, things that they were allowed to eat and things they were not allowed to eat. There's no doubt that a pagan king mostly delved in and ate the things that God told Israel they're not allowed to eat. The pork roast and whatever, catfish and whatever other kind of things that were not allowed, uh, uh, snails, what do you call it, escargot and, and uh, caviar, different things that Israel was told not to eat. This, that's the king's dinner. He's pagan. Those are the things that he ate. And you know, when I think of this and I think of Daniel saying, well, I'm, I'm willing to eat the vegetables. I know I'm allowed to eat that. Give me the vegetables. Keep the meat, keep the wine. And not just the wine, when they drank, they didn't just drink wine, they had blood in, the, in some of their drinks. They drank blood and, set, and offered in sacrifice to, to, to the pagan gods. So Daniel didn't want anything to do with the drink that they drank as well. But Daniel knew, he knew that when, when I say he stood on faith, when God gave that dietary law in Leviticus 18, did he have Daniel's best interest in mind? Or didn't he want them to enjoy food like the pagans enjoyed it? See, I believe Daniel knew in faith that God knew what was best for him. So he said, give me 10 days. I know God will let me eat vegetables. What you, those meats that you eat, they're not healthy for you. You give me 10 days, let me eat what God says to eat, and I'll bet you I'll look better than those other people. See, he's standing on faith. He's not just, this is not a miracle that he's expecting God to, to supernaturally energize his body in such a way that he's going to be different. He knew and trusted that when God made laws that, that, re, that re regulated Israel's diet, it was for Israel's best interest in mind. And Daniel was willing to stand on faith that it would work and show up in 10 days. That's what Daniel's doing. Besides that, the reason Daniel would not compromise, come with me to Exodus chapter 34. Daniel wouldn't compromise to eat that meat. He made the concessions... And they're willing to put it to a test. But Daniel, when he said that he would not eat the meat, there's some things he's compromising with. He's going along with the name change, is he not? Don't have much of a choice. But he's not saying, you call me that, then uh, I'm going to rebel. He's going along with that. He's going along with the school that they're putting in. He's going along with the fact he's going to work in the king's courts and be part of the cabinet of the king. He's going along with a lot of things. Daniel realized, hey, I have no control over these things. I'm going along with these things. I don't like it very much. Why would I want to be an advisor and give good advice to a heathen king who destroyed my country? Nothing seems to make any sense. But Daniel's compromising with all that. But when it came that the meat was put before Daniel, he purposed in his heart. And he said, I'm not eating that. I'll do a lot of things, but I won't eat that. And you know why? There's a verse of scripture and passages, more than what I'm going to share with you, that tell Daniel not to eat that. Probably some of it was against the diet. But others, as we relate to all this, we know in chapter 1, they keep flaunting the gods of Babylon in the face of the God of Israel, do they not? By taking the gold out of the palace and putting it in their palace, by taking the names away from Daniel and giving them pagan names, and the foods that they're going to eat are going to be foods that are offered or in sacrifice or meats, from animals that were offered in sacrifice to pagan gods. And Daniel knows from Exodus chapter 34 that he's not to have anything to do with sitting around eating the meats, uh, 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 the food, the meat of, of animals that were sacrificed to heathen gods. In Exodus chapter 34, um, verse 12, says, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether thou goest, lest it be a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break down their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and go a-whoring after their gods, 
and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. Anything to do that. When you go in that land, you break down their altars, you have nothing to do with those people, and you have nothing to do with their sacrifices, and if they call you and invite you, you don't go. You don't eat the things offered in sacrifice to those pagan gods. Uh, verse 16 says, And that thou take their daughters, uh, that, and that thou take th- their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. Pagan gods, all this small g, small g, small g, idolatry, molten gods, carved gods, gods of stone, uh, carved out of stone. Those gods, he's saying, you stay away from, and you don't even go in an invitation to eat the, the things that have been sacrificed to those gods. You stay away from it. Now, here's Daniel. The king, they just had a great feast. They bring the meat in before the king, and he spreads it, his meat, his, the things that are on his table, to those that are being trained to serve with him. And Daniel says, I'm not going to touch that meat. Now, I'll do a lot of compromising, but you know where he drew the line where he does not compromise? When he could open up his Bible and find a Bible verse that says, don't do that. See, I I, I begin to understand as I read the book of Daniel that we live in a a world system. We, We can't, we're not to compromise the truth of God ever. And sometimes we wonder if we're compromising with the system. I've been told that this church is against God's will because it's incorporated. Uh, for tax purposes. And I know some people that if you pay your taxes, you're helping the system of this world keep on going, and it's evil to do that. And so they, they have these standards that they don't get involved in some of these things. And I begin to wonder about it. Are we compromising? Well, I begin to realize in Daniel's case, there's areas he had to compromise in order to live. But when it came to go against a verse of Scripture that eventually, that, uh, that definitely says to him and clearly says, don't do that, Daniel draws a line and says, I purpose in my heart, I'm not doing that. Now let's see if we can work this thing out. I'll do something else, but I'm not going to do that. So th- that becomes a lesson to you and me. That we begin, that where we draw the line of compromise with the world system is when there's a Bible verse that tells us, don't do it. We no longer cross the line. That's when you purpose in your heart to stand and take a stand against something. Before that, perhaps we can work with some things. You know, Come over with me to the uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's interesting. Daniel knows what's going on here. We've seen it in history, so we know a little bit of the history that Daniel already knows. Daniel knows idolatry began in Babel, and then now because the nation of Israel failed to be the people God wanted them to be, God, they're back to Babel. God didn't want anybody to be part of it from the beginning, and now in Daniel's day, he don't want them to be part of it. You know, in a future day, you read Revelation chapter 17, and we're not going to get there, but Revelation chapter 17, 1 through 5, and you find out in a future day, a religious system called Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, is going to come back into being. In the old days, way back in Genesis 11, 10 and 11, you're not to be part of Babel, idolatrous worship. In Daniel's day, he's back under Babylon. He knows to draw the line. He's not going to have anything to do with Babylonian worship, not even in eating the meats that are offered in sacrifice to those pagan gods. In the future tribulation days, when the Antichrist is here, Babylonian worship, idolatry will be set up, an image of a beast is going to be set up. The whole thing will be back intact, and Israel, the nation of Israel, is going to have to purpose in their heart that they're not going to defile themselves, and they're going to have to live under those days. Daniel is a type for them. Daniel is two things. Daniel himself is a standard for the nation of Israel in his day. His friends, he was a testimony to his friends. It's always Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. It's always Daniel first. He seems to be a testimony to his friends. And his, he and his friends are a testimony to the nation of Israel that's in captivity of how to stand for the Lord. Yes, we're in Babylon. Here's some things we have to compromise with. But here's some things we don't have to compromise with, no matter what. So they're a testimony to the people in that day, but they're also a testimony in type to the future people who are going to live in the tribulation days. That's why we studied some of those things before we studied the book of Daniel. But, you know, not only was Babylon existed back in Genesis, and here it is showing up again in Daniel's day, and he takes a stand against it, and not only in a future day will they have to take a stand against it, we know from first, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 that the Apostle Paul said, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. 
Babylonian worship is around today. It's just any form of idolatry. Anything that's not based on the truth is based on a lie, and lie is the worship of Satan. And so the, the mystery of iniquity, Satan's plan to be worshipped as God, always is going throughout time. And it works and operates in our day. And Paul had to deal with it with the Corinthians. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where they were realizing, typical Corinthians, Corinthians were Christians who lived in the flesh rather than in the spirit. That is, rather than seeking to excel and to be uh, perfected in their Christianity, to go on in Christian maturity, they like to be the very least a Christian could be. What can a Christian do and get away with it? That's their idea. And see, some of the things that went on at Corinth, we're talking about a Gentile city, all kinds of idolatrous worship went on. And when they had sacrifices in the city of Corinth, they were parties. And man, these Christians, they wanted to go to those parties. And so they began to realize and think, and, and it was true fact, that you know those heathen over there, and they have these sacrifices, that the sacrifices that they're offering a sacrifice to an idol, that idol's not real. It's not God. I know it's not God. Therefore, I can go and join with them, just not worship their God, but enjoy the fun time together. Enjoy the meal. Enjoy the party. And so that's the kind of thing that they were doing at Corinth, and Paul had to rebuke them for that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says in verse 14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Don't have anything to do with pagan worship that's not based on the truth. I speak unto wise men, judge ye what I say, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of one bread. Behold Israel after the flesh, are, they, uh, are not they which eat of the sacrifice partakers of the altar? The nation of Israel, they were, if you went and ate with Israel, then and they had a sacrifice going on. What you're saying is, I'm identifying with your worship on that idol, on that, on that sacrifice, on that altar. I get it. The pagans offering sacrifice to idolatrous gods. And for them to join into that, they were actually joining, they were becoming part of that. And so he says, if you join with the heathens in idolatry, that makes you part of that. If you join with the nation of Israel in their altar, anybody who joined with them was part of their worship service. Uh, verse 19. What, sh what say I then? That an idol is nothing? Or that, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idol is nothing? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Notice this. Ye cannot drink the blood of... Uh, the, excuse me, the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be ta partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. You know, a lot of people read that and they say, well, what that's saying is you can't do that and be a Christian. And, you know, they're always trying to judge who's a Christian, who's not. You realize what he's saying? He's saying God doesn't permit this. God says don't do that. He's not saying you can't be a Christian and do it. They were doing it and they were Christians. But what he says, you cannot, you know, in the Christian life, there's some do's and don'ts. And, and this idea of going and joining with them and saying the idol's nothing and eating their, the meat offered to that sacrifice, you're actually becoming part of that whole service. You're not just eating a meat and partying with people. You're becoming everything they identify with. And he says, you cannot do the thing, that thing. In other words, stop doing it. You may not do it. Verse 22, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And... I'd like to at least see the, the application from this chapter concerning that. That when it asks that question, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? How could we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Well, you know, if you just kind of stop and look at chapter 10. Chapter 10, you see what they were doing. But if you go back even before that from the beginning, you find out that he is going back and he's talking about the nation of Israel and, and the things that they did. And he's warning us in verse 6. Now, these things were for our, ex for our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And what he's doing, he's saying, you know, the nation of Israel, they blew it with God. They went after things, and when they lusted, it provoked God's anger, his wrath. Verse 7 says, neither be idolaters, as some of them were, 23,000 died. 
Verse 9 says, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Look at verse 10. Neither were ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of destroyers. Now these things happen unto them for examples. And they were written for our admonition unto whom the ends of the world have come. Therefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. When he talks about temp, do we provoke God to jealousy? Provoke. You realize what that is? If a guy, I bump into a guy in a hallway and, and say, hey, what, you hit me? And I start talking up to him, talking, rebuking him, I'm provoking a fight. I'm saying, let's, let's get on with a fight here. The way the nation of Israel was acting, provoke God. Paul writes to the Corinthians and said, you know, those things are written for us. Watch, you're not provoking God. Watch that when you lust after evil things, that you're not provoking God. Watch when you're going after fornication, that you're not provoking God. Watch when you murmur against Christ, or first that you tempt Christ. Oh, if you loved me, think these things wouldn't happen to me. That's what the nation of Israel was always saying. That when you did that, you were tempting the Lord. Well, when you murmured, you were provoking His anger. You know, those are things that we do all the time, isn't it? And Paul, he's not talking about an individual and God's going to get you as an individual. He's warning the Gentiles. God was dealing with the nation of Israel. Now God's dealing with the believing Gentiles and Jews and made them part of the body of Christ. And he's warning us as the body of Christ. Let's not be like the nation of Israel was. Let's be a little bit different than that. And, you know, part of that tempting God, part of that idolatry and all that is the things of just questioning God's love for us. Daniel never questioned that. He knew where he stood, even though everything around him said, God, don't love me. He knew that was wrong. He knew where he stood. And murmur, he wasn't murmuring, complaining. He was living under the circumstance, tough as it might be. He knew not to provoke God's jealousy, God's wrath, God's anger. Why? Well, if you fight what God's doing, you're provoking God. If you go along with what God's doing, you just turn to him and wait on him for his strength to see you through. And you know, when you do that, look at verses, for instance, like verse 24. Let no man seek his own, but every man the wealth of others. You realize the things that that were going on in Corinth was all selfish. And the answer to it was get your eyes off yourself. Quit thinking about yourself, worrying about yourself. Think about what's better for someone else. And that'll stop you from murmuring, complaining, and all these other things that that is not approved of God. Uh, Verse 31 which is, sums up everything that Daniel did. It says, Where, uh, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now, you take that in Daniel. Isn't that what he was doing? Whether he ate or whether he drank, he was going to do it for God's glory. If he ate that king's meat, there's no glory for God. He participates in, 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 in a worship of a pagan god. Daniel says, I won't do that. The Corinthians... They wanted to just go and identify with the world and and the worldliness that was going on in their day. They were eating and drinking, but not to the glory of God. You and I, that's how we ought to live our life. Whether we eat, whatever we eat, and whatever we drink, we do it for the glory of God. And we'll see Daniel's testimony more next week, but I think we learn in a practical way things that how God works in our life to strengthen us. I'd like to just say that none of this is how you're saved. You're saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That same idea about waiting on the Lord is how a person is saved. You're not saved by working, trying, in your own effort, you'll never make it there. You're saved when you give up and you realize God did it all when Jesus Christ came to earth and paid for all our sins. The same idea of waiting is when I wait at a waiting room, I sit down and rest. I wait. I rest. That's what faith is. Being saved is resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that his blood on Calvary was the full payment of sin, and you trust in what he did rather than your own strength, and God will save you. Let's pray. Gracious God and Father, we realize that there is much application to not only Daniel's day, to a future day, and and even as it applies to our day, There's some real Christian principles here on how we can please you as your people. The idea of separation, things that we're not to be a part of, of ways uh, where we're supposed to draw a line and take a stand for you, 
and ways we're supposed to handle ourselves in this world. Sometimes we have to go along with some things, but not when it does not glorify you. In fact, it would glorify the devil when in fact it would be disobedience to you. So, Father, we thank you for these kind of principles that we can look to every day to be a guide to our life. And we pray, Lord, that we will kind of grow past carnality, that we won't be like the nation of Israel because they were like the nations of the earth. May we grow to perfection in our Christian life. May we learn how to stand for you, live for you, glorify you in our life, that we might be pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray, amen.